How North Goes South. Did William Shakespeare base his plays on the works of Sir Thomas North? Hi, my name is Robert Boog, and I come from the competitive world of Los Angeles real estate. Where noticing little things can often make a big difference. I do not claim to be an academic or a rogue scholar, but I had a homeowner compare me once to Columbo because I was persistent and I'd noticed something about his water heater. Now, ever noticed Columbo always wore a raincoat, yet he lived here in Los Angeles where it never rains? And in almost every Columbo episode, we'd hear this old man, you know that song? Duh, duh, duh. Weird, huh? Okay, I'm the author of a new book called The Real Life Mystery of Shakespeare's Lost Years, Solving the Mysteries, Myths, and Mistakes of William Shakespeare, where I ask if uh, Queen Elizabeth was raped. Here's what the book looks like. And you can even find it on Smashwords, where uh, using honor, music, and fainting, author Robert Booth, takes the reader on a journey that reveals the mysteries, myths, and mistakes of William Shakespeare. The most fun I've had in a long time reading a nonfiction book. That's pretty cool, right? Okay, recently I received a phone call from a fellow Oxfordian. He's convinced Dennis McCarthy is right. He asked me to share my thoughts. Did William Shakespeare base his masterpieces on the works of Sir Thomas North? Dennis McCarthy Jr. Schluter, along with Michael Blanding, deserve credit for proposing this theory, and I commend them for all their years of dedication and research. But as Lieutenant Columbo would say, there's just one thing. This is their website, by the way, SirThomasNorth.com. These introductory phrases represent North's unique verbal fingerprint. Just this. You can forget everything else about cardinals, pillars, consistories, etc. No one else has ever written something like this. You can check this now yourself on Google by typing in after them, in quotes, around 30, next them with, in quotes. This searches for every web page, book, blog, article, etc. Everything on the internet which has after them within 30 words of next them with. As you will see, and as shown here, every result is quoting either Henry VIII or North's Journal. And you can search Google Books, too. That's trillions of web pages, 40 million Google Books, no other results. While there is in Italy. Also, as June Schluter and I show in this, in this book, Thomas North's 1555 Travel Journal, there's two more passages in Henry VIII that also derive from Thomas North's entries in his travel journal, and uh, his experiences in Italy. It should be quite clear that these connections between the consistory cardinal parade passages cannot be coincidental. In fact, there are people who vehemently oppose the Thomas North theory, still accept that Thomas North's journal was indeed used for Henry VIII. Okay, I think we've seen enough now. <laughs> okay, so if you type in the phrase, after them, around 30, next them with, you will not find it anywhere not in any books, trillions of web pages, nowhere else but Thomas North or William Shakespeare. Therefore, Shakespeare stole word for word from North. So, in other words, after them, Shakespeare says after them. Now, I wondered if this was really proof or just a technicality. In other words, what if I capitalized after them or put a comma here what i i'm saying the same thing right but technically with a computer or google search i might get a different response now i'm not that smart and i accidentally capitalized the word after this led me to a totally different work so does it necessarily mean i borrowed it from thomas north no so, um, we'll put after them, around 30, next them with state papers. That's what I did. Do that, you'll come to this website here. And it's called 
Now here's the word pillars, right? And we want it uh, after them. Okay, remember he said after them. Um, then and before them. And they're talking about cardinals, several pillar born next before him, self. After them cometh the Pope's holiness in a chair of crimson velvet. This is from the state papers of uh, Mary. Um, this is Queen Bloody Mary. And you can find this uh, at that website that I generated before. Uh, it's really interesting. You can read through this entire... Um, it's, it's just like Thomas North's papers, to be honest. But let's continue here. I wanted to know who wrote it, and um, the state papers mention my master, the Lord of Eli, and it turns out it was written by Bishop Thomas Thurlby and his entourage, which included Viscount Montague and Sir Edward Carney. This is found in the state papers online, um, the 1509, and these were the official records of the secretaries of state serving the ruling monarch of the day. Now, my question was, were Thomas North's travel journals copied and returned to him? After all, they were the property of the crown. After Queen Mary's death, a copy of the journals might have been kept at Cecil House for safekeeping because uh, Queen Elizabeth was the uh, new queen after Queen Mary. The reason Queen Mary had sent the secret English ambassadors to Italy was for secret negotiations with the Pope. Um, state papers were kept by the Secretary of State. Who was Queen Mary's Secretary of State? John Vere, the father of Edward de Vere. Now, Oxford started living at Cecil House in 1562, and he was there from age 12 to 21. Lord Burley, of course, lived at Cecil House. He acted as the Secretary of State for Queen Elizabeth I. Here's uh, Edward de Vere. So if you were a curious 12 or 13-year-old, would you might you be snooping around to see what your father uh, did when he was Secretary of State? The papers were there at Cecil House. Now, why Edward de Vere makes sense, Edward's first tutor, Sir Thomas Smith, believed it was easier for someone to learn Greek first than Latin. So at age four, Edward was sent to live with the Smith family, and he started to learn Greek and then Latin at age four. This is important because Sir Thomas North was not as proficient in Greek as Edward de Vere. And if you compare the two, Sir Thomas North versus Edward de Vere, here are some, just some of the publications dedicated to Edward de Vere. Uh, you'll see uh, histories of Trogus Pompeius when Oxford was 14 years old, an Ethiopian history written in Greek by Helidorus, uh, Pistastrus and Cantanea. It just goes on and on. And we see the name Anthony Monday here. Anthony Monday. Anthony Monday. Anthony Monday. But why might 17-year-old Edward de Vere be interested in meeting Thomas North in person? And the answer is North had visited Italy and Oxford was planning a trip to Italy in 1575. So, Oxford's trip, he went down a similar route. Thomas North just went to Rome, while Edward de Vere went all the way down to Palermo, I believe. Also, North had translated the Dial of Princes. North's 1557 translation from the French had been ridiculed by some scholars. 
he used libro, which is Spanish for book, not livre, which is French. And it was supposed to have been Englished out of the French by Thomas Norris. Also, Marcus Aurelius was one of Oxford's heroes. Marcus Aurelius was considered one of the greatest Roman emperors. He believed in Stoicism, the gods exist and have concern for human affairs. Marcus Aurelius endured epilepsy, and so did Edward de Vere. Now, what's interesting, I saw this on Twitter the other day. Um, this woman, Francesca Sofia, she quoted him. In my darkest hours, I found relief and strength from reading Marcus Aurelius. Now, if you look here, you can see this is October 13th, 2021, she wrote this. So it's just, he. Now, some folks will say there's no connection between North and De Vere. Some will even say North would never meet with Edward De Vere. He did not like Oxford. North worked for a rival play company owned by the Earl of Leicester. Even though they traveled in the same circles, there is no proof these two men ever met, much less associated. But according to recovering academic Michael Hyde, and you can find this, uh, this is a review of the Blanding North book, Michael Hyde writes, not discussed in Blanding's book, North by Shakespeare, is whether Oxford could have seen the George North manuscript. I believe it is highly likely that he could have. First, we know that noble families shared private manuscripts. That was the culture. With few books available, literate people were eager to read anything they could get their hands on. Second, North wrote his discourse at Kirtling Hall, probably in 1576. In August 1578, Oxford joined the Queen's party at Audley End. Early in September, the assemblage next went to Kirtling Hall, about five miles away from Audley End, and about 20 miles from Oxford's residence at Headingham Castle. Yes, he, Edward de Vere could have read North's stuff. Also, North's book editor was Anthony Munday. And who did Anthony Munday work for? The answer is Edward de Vere. Now, in this article on justor.org, there is an article about Sir Thomas North's marginalia in his print, Dial of Prince, says. And what's interesting about this article, Kelly Quinn claims that the marginalia that North wrote in his Dial of Princes was not used by his editor. And that's interesting, I think. But that might be a topic for another day. Stylometry has been called the study of the style of something, such as a written text, so as to determine the authorship. People ask, didn't stylometrics prove Shakespeare wrote, alone wrote, the canon? The answer is no. Stylometry has been used to compare Edward de Vere's original poetry to Shakespeare's writing, but in the next video, I'm going to use it to sell you, or convince you, on something I stumbled upon by accident. And that is this. Edward de Vere wrote The Dial of Princess, and he wrote Plutarch's Life. He gave credit for these two works to Thomas North. Therefore, all, much or all of Dennis McCarthy's linguistic research helps to prove Edward de Vere's authorship of the Shakespeare canon. Again, he's saying Thomas North wrote this and therefore William Shakespeare wrote this. But on the other hand, if it's Edward de Vere who wrote Plutarch, then he's just rewriting what he had written before, which seems to make more sense to me. Now, I know how you feel. Dennis McCarthy is very convincing, and many people have felt that he might be right about Shakespeare borrowing from Sir Thomas North. But what I've found is something very simple and obvious. And when you see it, 
you may think to yourself, oh, okay, I get it. It's kind of like the simple explanation for after them around 30, next them with, that we did earlier. Also, if you believe in another candidate, it's not a problem. I'm a writer, not a fighter. So um, in the meantime, go check out my book and see my observations there, including the one about Queen Elizabeth I. She remained a virgin, so is it possible she was raped? And if so, how would we know about it today? And you can find it on Amazon.com. If you look inside, you can read a chapter or two. And uh, I think you'll like it. Anyway, that's it for today. I've got a, a video to, to uh, create. Uh, this is my website, robertboog.com. And I have a special launch price that you can find if you're okay with um, a PDF file of my book. So it's a little bit cheaper there. Anyway, thank you for watching. This is the end of this video, and I'll see you on the next one.